I'm Keith McCullough and welcome to another Real Conversation with one of my faves. She's got her own hashtag now, DDB, Daniel DiMartino Booth, the one and only. Thanks for uh, having another conversation with me live on the Switch. Happy to be here, always. Next time's going to be in Connecticut. We're going to figure this out. We, uh, yeah, that'll, that'll be fun. Uh, just wanted to see what's the, like, what's the latest bee in your bonnet. What do you, what do you got going on? Well, just the combination of this mass, massive fiscal and monetary, you know, hashtag J and J backfire of all time. I mean, you, you, your quit rate this morning, which happens to be one of the J's of the hashtag J and J. Janet Yellen's favorite labor market indicator has soared to a 2.7 percent 20 year high in this morning's jolts data, the job openings data. And I call the quits factor the take this job and shove it factor, because that's how <laughs> confident people feel that they can leave their positions. So that's at a 2.7 million high. You've got Google workers saying, you know, if, if they tell me that I have to go back into the office, I'm going to quit. And so there's this there's a lot of aggression. There's a lot of assertiveness out there because the Warren Buffett indicator, which is he likes to drive by and kick things to see how they work, kick the tires. Well, if you're an employee and you're driving around and all you see are help wanted signs, you're like, man, I've got all the power in the world. And then Blackstone comes out this morning and they're like, we're inviting back vaccinated employees into the office on June the 7th. So um, <laughs> here's your opposite end of the spectrum. They're just lovely, polite verbs, but we're inviting back vaccinated employees on June 7th. Let me think that's in less than a month. So my, my good fishing buddy, Torsten Slack, he's over at Apollo, he, he, he put up a, a slide that shows the number of people t working from home has been halved in the last year. So we're down 58 to 27 million. And so it, we are in interesting times right now because so many Americans have been convinced that they don't need to work and that they can get paid more to sit on their ass. Now, there was um, something I'm just going to read this tweet because uh, you... You rarely go, well, actually, you go all caps on people sometimes. You go, boom, like that one was in there, I think, when I was reviewing your tweets. But, um, and you're like, you're yelling, and I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I love rev reviewing your tweets. They're awesome. Uh, so this one on, on when you went uh, off on this bottleneck thing. So there's this comment by a Fed member about bottlenecks and shortages. What, what do you mean by that? So Mary Daly, San Francisco Fed, of course, um, came out and said that there were there were bottlenecks. And I'm like, yes, it's a bottleneck that is created by a fiscal backfire that is facilitated by a monetary backfire, basically. I, I'm quoting myself. But the point is, there's a lot of complicity going around, but nobody at the Fed right now is taking blame for what's happening in the labor market, what's happening in the housing market, what what's happening in the financial markets, nothing. It, none of it is their fault. Well, this is, I mean, this is interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you saw clips of it or not or any, uh, anyone talking about it. Uh, I had a, a good conversation with Chris Whalen uh, last week on this topic. And he was like, uh, uh, you talk about being aggressive. I mean, he used to work at the Fed just like you. And, and he was making aggressive uh, comments about the Fed and, and just their lack of accountability or any wanting to have anything to do with the fiscal side or the political debate. And then this morning, you know, you, you, you were, I think you were tweeting about it as well, the Wall Street Journal op-ed by Druckenmiller, who took kind of the same line. Now you're taking the same line. All three of you might as well just lock hands, Red Rover, here we come over, and, and walk on up to the, to the hill, because these people don't seem to, to want anything to do with that, correct? Look, if you go to the very, if you go to the homepage of the Federal Reserve Board, in Washington, see just the home page. It's the propaganda page. <laughs> Federal Reserve policy is designed in the public interest. In the public interest, you have home prices. We find out from the National Association of Realtors going up at 14.8 percent year over year, the highest on record, wiping out anything in data back to 1989. I'm sorry, but there's nothing in the public interest about first-time home buyers, the the unlucky ones who are getting in with FHA loans. There's nothing lucky. There's nothing about making policy in the, in the public interest when you have this kind of runaway asset inflation and the Fed can't even like, you know, raise a, a, a white flag and say, okay, okay, so the MBS thing, we might, need to, we might need to pull back on the MBS thing. Instead, they took Robert Kaplan like into the back room, the Dallas Fed's Robert Kaplan, so I had to walk his comments back yesterday. He really must've gotten his wrist slipped, slapped, excuse me. 
I mean, it's, 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 it's slapping, it's burying, it's, it's embarrassing. If you look at uh, slide 47 in our deck, you'll, we have a nice cartoon for this, which is price discovery getting buried, quite literally. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's a weird thing to kind of watch these two do this dance or do this shoveling as we're, as we're lining it up. And on the right side, I don't know if you can see it, but all the goodies are there with child tax credits. Infrastructure spending that continues to go beyond $4 trillion in student loan forgiveness, first-time homebuyer tax credits, and things of that ilk. You know, what, what is it about uh, Powell uh, in particular that just doesn't want to engage in the public debate but is doing, you know, again, what you're just pointing out behind the scenes? You know, I'm, some part of me is torn because we know that before Powell pivoted in January 2019 that there was actually the lights were on and somebody was home. Mm -hmm. but we, we know that there's, <clears throat> you know, the vestiges of common sense is somewhere inside of that head. And you have to ask yourself, has he already been informed by the powers that be that he just has to hold on for eight months mm. and then he's out the door? I mean, that's people need to understand that that he is a Republican and having monetary policy facilitate socialism was probably not on his to do list. <laughs> when he was a no, as a conservative. No. So, I don't think he wants to, you know, I, I, I think he's desperately trying to avoid the next end game. I think the financial stability report was published when it was and that people were allowed to make rumblings about financial instability and then Lale Brainerd, his presumptive, you know, if if he's going to be succeeded by somebody sitting on that board, it will be Lale Brainerd. So she authored the financial stability report and, and said significant declines in risky asset prices. It's, it feels like the Fed wants to engineer a soft correction in the stock market. That's what it feels like. But, but his, like, I want to go back to one thing you said there, which is eight months, T minus eight months. And what he's going to do next, which is going to be, is it crazy to assume that he's just going to do what he did before and get paid a lot of money by Carlisle or whoever to do it? And that's why he just shuts up? Well, Keith, he's, he's worth $150 million. And, yeah. and he. He wanted to serve his country. I feel badly for him if he gets renominated mm -hmm. because he's never been there for the money. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to be there for when the next time comes. I mean, we've seen an entire when Jamie Dimon came out a few weeks ago in his letter and said, you know, well, he's hoping for a good economy for the next one or two years. That's not a decade long recovery. And we're seeing things happen in such a time compression chamber because of the magnitude of stimulus that's being pushed out into the market that the next hiccup's not going to take as long as a decade to, to occur. It's just not. And that means that, that if it's Jay Powell after the end of January who's still there, he will potentially be called upon to consider negative interest rates or a central bank digital currency, some way to ensure that money arrives in the hands of those who need it most. But again, that's that's Federal Reserve policy facilitating socialism. And you know, I was proud of Druckenmiller and the op-ed that came out this morning and him saying, you know, inclusiveness, climate change, these are noble, noble, noble ends. The Fed has nothing to do with these, it, nothing. And they need to be focused on interest rate policy and how their policy is transmitting into the real economy, supposedly so that they can make policy in the good in 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 the interest of the public. Well, I, I guess on that on that front, and this is again what Whalen said, and again Drucken Miller says it today, and it's I could say it, you can say it, but there was a time when the Fed actually stayed with that dual mandate and walked right on up to the hill uh, with, you know, some people would come after Volcker, at least show him a two by four. It was not popular. Um, and again, fighting for the people with the currency, strong currency, trying to weaken inflation, using it as a blunt instrument. That's, that's nowhere near, it seems, where Powell could end up in the next. Again, if he has T minus eight months on the clock, and there's really, you know, by the time we see the whites of the eyes on these headline inflation reports, he can just say the word transitory until he's out the door, can he not? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of looks like he's plugged in. I, I don't right. mean plugged in as in in the know. I mean, plugged into an electrical outlet because he just repeats himself <laughs> over and over and right. over. And he's right. like, just repeat the narrative. And you know what? If push comes to shove, the Fed can start to sell their tips, right? <laughs> they talked up the inflation narrative by buying the tips if they really want to say that it's that, that inflation is transitory, that, you know, we, we can have a party where China dumps all of the 
resource is it's sitting on, we know China's sitting on record levels of steel and copper, et cetera. But you could have that kind of a party because Yellen's already said, I'm gonna be nice to China, nice China. <laughs> so China knows they can do what they want, but you could have a combination of China and the Fed selling its tips position after these nasty April and May base effect prints come and go. And, and you've got high schoolers rejoining the workforce. I, I, I know more than a few parents who are like, a lot of these help wanted signs are gonna be filled. Mm -hmm. my, my kid's gonna work this summer. And then you've got lobbyists on the Hill saying, September 16th, I'm finished. McDonald's, Hilton, Corporation, all of these places that cannot fill positions and aren't, aren't you know, the, the, the anger element, Keith, on, on, on Twitter is intriguing to me. People are like, power to the people. And I'm like, well, it really doesn't work like that. Because if, if things go haywire enough to where companies' profits get hit and their stocks go down and they have to cut costs, then they're going to fire more people. I mean, people are not connecting the dots in terms of they just need to raise wages. They just need to raise wages. And by the way, why stick the knife in the heart of small businesses that are already down that can't compete with Walmart and Amazon and Chipotle raising wages? Well, it's, it's one thing to say you're going to raise wages. It's another thing to have raised wages, wages and offer those higher wages and not have any, anyone show up. That's a very obvious reality, I think, if you just kind of like think it through. Like I, you can walk down you know, Main Street in Columbus, Ohio, or one of the main streets, they have many, and you'll see quite literally like yard sale signs. I'm sixteen fifty an hour. I'm seventeen twenty five an hour. I'm this an hour. And that's to work you know, in the service economy, at Dunkin' Donuts, wherever it may be. Um, so that, that's, that's one part of it. But the other part that you just said, which is what sticks, you know, this damn word transitory, it's a word that, first of all, the words base effects have never come out of Powell's mouth. I know where he got them. Um, secondly, you know, it's, it's Wall Street's narrative. If, if it's about base effects and it's transitory, then it's Goldilocks. That's what Wall Street wants you to believe if you're running trillions of dollars, right? Because then you never have a problem in high yield. You never have a problem in the S&P 500. You never have a problem in asset price terms. So that's my own take on it. Um, just one other point on that to shape that take on slide 15. Like it's, it, the only thing that's going to be transitory is the spike like to the high prints. Like you said, in May and in June. By the way, the May number is going to get reported in June, so it's June. And then the June number, by the way, is, is in the third quarter number, uh, is in the second quarter number. The, the July lapping number isn't exactly going to be a low print either. So you're going to take them right into Jackson Hole with some very elevated and what I think will look sticky. It doesn't have to be, and I want your opinion on this, I don't think it has to be transitory at all. I mean, it just has to stick. And if inflation sticks, whether it be labor, which is an easy one to make a call on that, or some of these commodity prices, it's, you're going to have maybe a mild disinflation, but you're not going to have like what I'm used to, which is making a big quad four, shit hits the fan, bring in the Fed deflation call. What do you think? Well, I mean, you know, Keith, we'll see. There's 17 million able-bodied workers out there. I mean, the, the, the slack in the labor market, it is what it is, but it's, it's man-made. That's why I keep saying it's a fiscal and monetary backfire. It's not that there aren't human beings to be had. It's not that there aren't people who can do who can fill these low skilled positions. Right. That's not the case. In fact, if you talk to manufacturers, manufacturers are looking for low skilled employers. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the Jolt data this morning. But but they're specifically looking for low skilled workers. If you give people a mathematical choice on September the sixth, as as in, are you going to stop eating what you've grown used to eating since the CARES Act was passed? Or are you going to go get a job? Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, people and the market will figure this out. The market will look ahead. Well, the market currently hasn't looked ahead at, at any risks associated with that. Bond yields continue to go higher. Dollar continues to go lower. That's a risk. Let's be clear, the dollar, you know, for real people. Um, but in terms of pricing assets, like if you're trying to find like reflation or what we call quad two, it's characteristically dollar down, reflation, rising interest rates, you know, rising cyclical stocks. I mean, that's, that's basically what we have. So the, so the market, to me at least, hasn't been concerned about that yet. Uh, what, what do you mean in terms of like, you know, the real concern? Are you talking about labor and it, you know, these, you know, the, the shortages and the stickiness of labor as in wages? You know, this is, it, it, even if it's something that ends by the time we get to Labor Day, that's a hell of a long time to try and hang on when it's 60 to 70% of your cost structure. Yeah, okay, fair enough. When you're coming off of 
huge fat margins. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like my, my brother's, not that everybody needs to know, but I guess it's gonna come out of my mouth anyway, but he's a, he's a, he's a McDonald's franchisee. So I get this picture. You go from, pre, you know, from pre-COVID, very, McDonald's is one of the best businesses in the world in terms of its predictability, I and mean, that's not a commercial. Uh, but again, it's margins. Now that's changing, right? So you, by virtue of what you just said, not only you know, internally, but externally in terms of what everybody else has to offer that same incremental hire. And that's gonna be a really interesting thing for the American economy, because there's so many service-oriented businesses that operate on maybe not that good of a margin at the service level, but pretty damn close. Yep. No, look, again, I, I, I think that, that the, the dichotomy today is hysterical. Don't get me wrong. We're not all private equity, you know, bankers, big swinging dicks who are headed back into the office because we sure as hell are not talking about a minimum wage lifestyle that we're being told to go, we're being invited back into the office to go back to. So I, I, I don't know how employers, I don't know how this is all going to shake out because there, there's this notion that employers are just going to roll over and play dead and pay up whatever the wage increases are and just say, oh, margins, margins, who cares? I, I don't I don't see that as being a possibility. And I think that people need to be on the lookout for peak growth. We've seen signals emanating from China of peak growth and things tend to start there and ripple over. Yeah, well, there you can't, I mean, you're going to have a, you're, you're, first of all, we're already in quad three stagflation in in China. You're going to have a revolution if it's not already brewing, if they screw the people like quite literally with wage declines. Um, but here, again, that I think that that's the picture, like the one that I want to get to, because I've obviously been bullish on on things that are risk on, so to speak. Uh, but again, I, I realize the horse that I'm riding and I'll eventually get off it because it's, it's going to turn into a bloody mule. I mean, you end up in a place where you're going to have a much higher labor cost structure than the U.S. economy has ever had before. And that to me, like you could go from the best of, of worlds this quarter, you know, Danielle, there's not going to be a better quarter than the second quarter of 2021 if you're just looking at revenue growth against cash flow growth and the margin embedded therein. So you may actually, you, that, that base effect, if you want to talk about base effects, by the time you get to the midterms or by the time you get to next year, you're going to have some pretty significant corporate uh, margin degradation and profit declines as a result on a year-over-year -year basis. So that will, you know, that, that to me is, I, th I think that's what you're saying. I'm just trying to say that in my own rate of change vernacular. Are we talking about the same thing? We are. And even if you look at what the, the, the Federal Reserve's own um, own expectations are, or the street for that matters, for GDP in the third quarter and fourth quarter. You know, it, it, that's why the Biden administration is already trying to talk about a fourth stimulus check. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know what a non-stimmy check world looks like at all. Mm -hmm. They don't want to know what the other side looks like. But if you look at the GDP estimates heading into the end of this year, we're going back down to a very low trend. And if that is the case, and if labor ends up being st as sticky as you think it could be into the third and fourth quarter, to, yeah, you got stag written all over this. Mm -hmm. Now, stagflation, you know, as a policy, of course, you know, Volcker's only famous because we were dumb enough to, to, to put up with stagflation you know, from a central planning perspective for, for a good decade before he stepped in. Now, is that, are we on the beginning of that 1970s redo? I hate sticking it on one period in time, because as you know, it's always different. Uh, but the mm -hmm. components, the components are, are, are actually somewhat similar with the dollar declines, the deficit building, uh, and you know, definitely the political shift. So there are, there are definitely similarities, but I would argue that, that the runaway inflation at the time was also grounded in unions being as powerful yes. as they were back then. Mm -hmm. So there were other, there were other factors. I would say a bigger factor this time around that could speak to rising prices is the fact that that China no longer is is exporting deflation in the form of cheaper labor. Mm -hmm. That's no longer an option. Mm -hmm. And that's something that was definitely a secular pull that it, that element is no longer in the global economy. Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of in, I have this these conversations, I'm sure you do too. institutional, uh, investors are always asking about the cyclical inflation we're calling for versus the secular deflation that they're expecting, and they'll rattle off everything from technology to China, et cetera. When you actually go down the old list, you find things that you can't check the boxes on anymore, <laughs> and, right. you, and you just nailed one of them. 
Yeah, and that's but that's huge because it's been a global phenomenon, and China has been the chief driver of growth. I'm not saying that China's not putting up some great numbers. Everybody's putting up great numbers because we were in the abyss a year ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not going as fast as they possibly can with robotics and artificial intelligence, knowing that at some point they could have a, a labor shortage of their own. Mm-hmm. Well, that demographic decline is nasty. Uh, you know, China's being, we, you know, we model it 35 to 54 year olds in China. I mean, it looks as bad as Japan's ever looked, you know, in its worst of times. And that's, that's a huge headwind for them in as much as the industrial economy. So there's a lot of issues in China. Um, but on the dollar, I, I want to get your reaction to this chart because this, this takes us back at least and considers the 1970s, considers the 80s and 90s, and obviously the period we're in now. And it shows the broad trade-weighted dollar against the deficit, which is basically the summary of all this nonsense, you know, at least from your and my perspective. We're not like raging socialists. Um, but again, the, the, the curve on slide 48, guys, is basically the deficit inverted against uh, slide 48. You got to go up a couple more right there. Uh, the, like, look at that thing. The black line is the deficit inverted collapsing. And this goes all the way back to when I was born. So this is obviously back to 1974-75. That was the period, as you know, that we went for the deficit. You know, deficit starts to go up. So the black line went down. Dollar went to, at that point, its lows. Then in comes Volcker. Dollar rips. You know, we get get some kind of sobriety. Uh, But again, you know, whoever didn't know, Reagan was a deficit guy. Uh, You know, deficit goes up, dollar goes down from that local high. And Bernanke is the one who gets, you know, the nice big, uh, I guess in his own mind, a non-gold medal, because I don't think he wants to talk about gold ever. Uh, but he gets the, the medal for the 40-year low in the dollar when the deficit in 2010 and 11 was once again going to its lowest level in US history. So, so what is it about that picture? And I think it's, Druckenmiller was the first, like, I got a lot of macro tourists to deal with on, on Twitter. You know, you're not one of them. Um, but people that literally don't know the history of the dollar or what has a causal impact. One of the biggest causal impacts is the one that, that I'm showing you. You don't just get a free lunch by printing money you know, ad nauseum and, and, and doing it again and again and again and again without the other side of the trade, which is dollar down, inflation and dollars up. Look, I got, I got one name for you, Keith, and that's Joe Manchin. And I, I really yep. do think he's that important. The Senate par- parliamentarian has already said that, that, that the Senate has been approved to push through three pieces of legislation in one calendar year via reconciliation, dot, 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 if Joe Manchin says we can. Yeah. And it, it really is that simple it, it, because he is, if you want to think about it, he's more powerful than Kamala Harris because he's the true tiebreaker mm-hmm. in the Senate. But the Senate has, it's got the green light. It's got the green light for three in one calendar year. I, I'm sure that th- it's like, they're like, holy shit. Texas just picked up how many seats yeah. in California lost, and we've only got a six seat margin in the house. And I mean, right now, what you're talking about is a lot less in my world and a lot more inside the Beltway's world, mm. because that's what it's come down to. It really, really has, If whether or not there's going to be an adult in the room or not. And sadly enough, the $4 trillion that's, that's under consideration, it really isn't what you would consider to be productivity enhancing long-term spending. No, it's I mean, spread out and it smells a lot like pork. Well, the bid ask spread on that today and again, all we're really talking about just to make sure that we're still talking about that same chart is how much lower the black line or the deficit when you turn it upside down goes. In other words, how high the deficit goes. Right. You know, so today it's like 800 800 billion versus uh, I don't know, 2 trillion. And then you got AOC, she's got 10 trillion over here. You know, it's it's <laughs> these things are you know, so so you're saying that if Joe Manchin you know, basically votes this way, then America looks like this, the, the great state of New York. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> As AOC envisions it to be. Yes. Um, no, it's a big deal, right? I mean, you, the, for a long time, you know, the Senate was, was a, of, a, of, a, of a different party. You know, so, so you do have, an, it is an interesting, obviously it's a gigantic state, but it's, it's, it's an example of the progressive side of, of, of the way that the world should go according to them, and that's already going there. And I think that that's why um, investing luminaries who have a, a front row view, uh, a front row seat to what's happened to New York City. Yeah. I think that that is why they have um, the perspective that they do. I've been to New York twice in the last few weeks. Um, 
I, I'm speechless. I'm, I'm speechless that that, uh, that that policies could actually try and destroy a city. Mm -hmm. Well, the economics top down can uh, the economic policy and and the economics as they as they continue to manifest absolutely have turned New York into that place before. It's just that you and I are a little yeah. too too young but, to have experienced it. JP Morgan was going to have more people in more employees in the state of Texas prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. They were already moving in that direction. But, you know, if you want if you want to put the revolving door, you know, on on a high speed, then then go ahead and ram through the highest taxes, you know, in, in, in the United States. Yeah, you can you can do that all you want. You can you but devaluing the dollar is again the best way to keep up with that is for somebody like me and somebody like you or somebody like anybody to ruthlessly buy anything that is highly correlated inversely with the dollar. That's why we're getting paid so much bloody money, you know, again, just trying to keep pace. The problem is that the people get screwed by that because, you know, whatever, 95% of people don't know how to trade currencies, obviously, against a basket of, of commodities or energy stocks. They're just going to get plowed. And that's the problem is that it's, it's the people that are going to get the pay the price, ironically enough, and that's who Janet Yellen is standing there heroically. She, she says she stands for them. I mean, I, to me, I still can't tie it together other than the fact that they've never tied themselves to the dollar, to the purchasing power of the people. Is there any possible way that this becomes a political debate anytime soon? And by the way, now it's Janet Yellen's job. Right. You know, when, she she, was, when she was at the Fed, you, you were expressly prohibited from talking about the greenback when you're at the Fed. Right. And by the same token, you're not supposed to talk about interest rates at the Treasury. Anyways, that felt like it was planted, or she really is that clueless. But right now, as head of the Treasury, it is her purview to talk about the dollar. A strong dollar is her mandate. <laughs> well, that's not something that, you know, Geithner didn't believe that, obviously. Um, you know, a lot of Treasury secretaries, some are completely full of shit. I mean, if you go all the way back in history, well, a lot of politicians are. It's her job to say are. that she advocates for a strong dollar. That's her right. job. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, do, 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 do you think that there's actually legitimately going to be a debate any time between now and when the shit hits the fan that the dollar is, a, is the problem by, by the function of these two the Fed and the Treasury getting in bed together or not? That You're talking about a very honest discussion here. <laughs> exactly. It's not going to happen. I can't see it. I mean, I just... It, and the thing is, when you see things like Janet Yellen having to walk her comments back the day that she made them, it's patently apparent that there is some communication going on between Fed and the Treasury right now, maybe not the kind of communication that you want, but again, if you think about whose head's on the chopping block, Quarles, Clarida, possibly Powell, and who might be brought in to get tougher on bank regulation, get, be a better Wall Street cop, and <laughs> all, all of these goals that they have, and meanwhile back at the ranch, you know, my, my buddy Charlie Gasparino had, had, a, had a column out over the weekend that shows that in the first 100 days of an administration, there have never been this many empty seats at the SEC. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, well, who the hell wants to get, you know, on, if you, it, and that's why I keep saying basically the same thing over and over again, is that I'm trying to find a way where I'm wrong. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, if I'm wrong and I, and, and the dollar starts to rip me a new one to the upside, I'm going to get plowed in everything that I own. You know, so I'm trying to figure out, not just for the sake of like my selfishly trying to make money every single day that I can for my family, for my firm. It's, it's to understand like, where could this go wrong politically? And, and I just can't find anybody that's even coming into the building to your point, and nobody wants these seats. No, no. What, what do you want like to have like a sticker that says, I destroyed Bitcoin today? Because <laughs> no. no, no. No, no in, fa in fact, you have the one guy that wants the seat in Gensler that, abs that loves Bitcoin. So you, you have the opposite of that. Look, it, the, the one thing that was in the financial stability report that was correct is that we don't know about the other hedge funds out there that have too much leverage. Mm -hmm. It's just it's a flat out mystery. We're, we're not inside these prime brokers. We know prime brokers have de-risked over the last few weeks. We know that. We know that prime brokers, if they had too much concentration with one given client, they pulled back and we, we know that. But do we know in the aggregate, you know, what leverage really is in the system? You could 
You can put up a chart of margin debt all day long, but that's only going to give you a very limited prism into leverage overall in the market. Well, so, you, could, you, you could, I mean, to be clear, and this is the whole point about every topic we've touched. If you actually had somebody having a truth-telling conversation, you could absolutely, all you'd have to do is give me the keys tonight when they shut down J.P. Morgan, if that's a thing. I'd walk in, you give me all their client prime brokerage data, I'll tell you exactly who's levered out the wazoo. It's not, it's not that hard. Right? It's, uh, no. it's, it's actually telling the truth about who's got what and when. And we're just not willing to do it. We're not willing to do it at the dollar level against the people. We're not willing to do it at the prime brokerage level in terms of what the financial leverage is at the customer level. We're not willing to talk about any truth. Everybody just wants to fucking get paid. Well, good, because there's nobody at the SEC that's going to even try and enforce that. So good, Keith. We're all on the same page. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, is, if, we, if we start with that, don't we just end up with where we've always been? Everyone wants to get paid, either politically or literally, um, or both. Yeah, like you said, Powell's going to be worth, a, you know, might be worth 200 million bucks with all uh, everything that happens in eight months from now. It's, it's people, if you start with that instead of with the principles of the country, you know, things like the purchasing power of the people, like the dollar, you know, you would have too honest of a conversation. And my fear here is that basically Neil Howe's right. We're in the middle of the fourth turning. And that's what you get. You get all that and more and more of that until it frustrates people like you and I, the Canadian capitalists and the, you know, the gal from Tejas. I mean, you're going to sit there. We're not going to be able to do anything about this. No, you know, and it's interesting right now, especially is intriguing because when COVID first hit, you know, you have some indicators that are like just your commonsensical indicators. One of the commonsensical indicators for me was the weekly, the weekly flyer from the grocery store. And when COVID first hit, it was like one page, just one page. <laughs> it wasn't like a little open it up, blah, blah, blah. It's back to being one page. Yeah. And cause you, you mentioned anger and prices at the pump. So right now it, it has to be even more infuriating to the same cohort who's saying we're angry we want higher wages we want higher pay we don't need to go back into the workforce on top of it all the fed excludes food and energy costs that are going through the roof that's yeah crazy i mean so i mean because i mean i if i hope we've learned that inequality is an economic phenomena i hope we've learned i hope we figured this out in the last 18 months there is there any case to be made uh that that the fed has not been the number one perpetuator of inequality? No, I mean, it, well, what started with teachers unions in the 70s and the 80s and started opening that divide was then, was that, well, it was put into hyperdrive by Fed policy, starting in 87. So you start in 87 and at every turn, again, you just show me the, the go back to that, um, Slide 48, or pick any chart. That, in 2011, for those of you that don't know, that's when the cost of living on a, on a real basis hit uh, not only a cycle high, but a 40-year low on the U.S. dollar index. The, the CRB commodities index hit it at that point its all-time high. Gold hit its all-time high. You know, the only person that wouldn't talk about inflation was Ben Bernanke, and he certainly wouldn't talk about the dollar. So what I mean by perpetuating inequality, I mean just ignoring or being willfully blind to the number one factor that perpetuates inequality. It's not that hard, you know? The cost of things go up when the things that you're paying for it goes down. Yep. No, it, Keith, it's not hard at all, but it's, it, but, but it's truly in your face right now. And you've got states, you've got Alabama, Montana, South Carolina, Mississippi. The states are lining up to pull these unemployment benefits, the federal unemplo unemplo unemployment benefits. They're giving money back to the government, literally. And so we're going to see in... You know, it, it won't happen in New York and it won't happen in California, but you're certainly going to see pockets of unrest start to bubble over in other parts of the country. I mean, I, I, you're, you're going to see, uh, for me, at least, you know, I was raised by uh, a, a, a firefighter who was on a, on a limited budget, or I guess I never thought of myself as part of a class. I mean, we were quite happy and Irish Catholics, you know, just grinding away. And uh, you know, it's, it's, but you absolutely do feel every bit of that incremental cost of living at the pump and, and, and in, your, in your refrigerator. That, those are the two things that matter next to, you know, to your shelter. And, and shelter, there's another one. Okay, so- Oh my gosh, I mean, what the Fed has done with housing. 
You had the New York Fed come out yesterday and households expectations for rent growth in the next 12 months are 9.3% series high. Yeah. Households expectations for home price growth, 5.5% next 12 months, series high. We've never seen these kinds of numbers. But and they, yeah, go, go ahead. Keep, sorry to interrupt. You, according to the census, 4 million American households will be evicted within two months if, if the foreclosure moratoriums come out. So Keith, since we're on the subject of anger and the Fed propagating anger and the Fed making the anger element that much worse by widening the inequality debt, what the hell is going to happen if anybody's able to, to, to evict somebody and they come out and the price to rent a house is like up 15%, up 10% year over year? How's <laughs> that going to work out? That's going to be a minimum. I mean, guys, do you have the um, uh, CPI shelter component chart? I don't know if we have it available, but in the words of your former favorite president in his own mind, believe me, it's, it's going to hook higher really fast because it's coming off the cycle low and it comes on a lag. So when you talk about the stickiness of headline CPI, you know, that's going to be a huge driver of keeping it up to where it's going. Okay. And that is the, that is by far the largest input. Yeah. In whether we're talking about the PCI or the, the PC or the CPI, it's it's a third it's it's a third of it. I mean, um, the other the other thing you tweeted uh, another way to think about you know this is just the wealth of the people that own the inflation. So think about it really simply, okay? So again, and we have a lot of people that are actually the people, Danielle, and I'm very proud of that. They're they're not people looking for bullshit on MSM or CNBC spew. They want actually the truth. That's why they listen to us. So you know you you had this great tweet um, that you retweeted a guy by the name of Gabriel where you showed the wealth of it all. Now I'm not not embarrassed for people being wealthy. I've never gotten more wealthy than when the dollar goes down because I know what the hell to buy. You know, what I'm saying is that I get that game. I'm trying to explain it to people. Who's driving that is the Fed combined now and weaponized with MMT and Janet Yellen in the Treasury. And, and I'm willing to talk about it. Meanwhile, I'm getting paid by it, okay? If they stop doing that, I stop getting paid. So it's not me that, that's the problem. <laughs> I just want to make sure that you and I are clear on that. You know, we're actually telling people how, you know, how we're making money on this. Look, Keith, there are no elegant answers right now. And um, you know, a buddy of mine who's, who's in FX came out and said, you know, the way he sees the stars lining up because commodities are rising while at the same time bond yields are rising at the same time the stock market is going down. He was like, that typically means dollar is going to have a pocket of strength in here, which yeah. would surprise a lot of people. Well, a lot of people got surprised, to be clear. Like, I got a lot of friends, former friends in FX, they get annoyed by me royally now because I just make fun of their moving averages. But, you know, six weeks ago, everyone was saying, you know, in consensus FX space, oh, look at the dollar, it's breaking out. Uh -uh. It got impaled at a lower high and has been breaking down, slide 65. And what the dollar is really doing is it's coming off a 20-year high. <laughs> and that's, right. a, that's, a, that's a major thing. Right? It's just not. It's just. It's just go, not doing so in a straight line. Go to slide sixty-two, guys. You know, and 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 uh, yeah, there we go. So that where that chart peaks. First of all, the dollar goes up when we have quad four deflation. What causes quad four deflation? A strengthening dollar. Things are priced in dollars. They go down in price when the dollar goes up. It's so easy. I can explain it. Those two green arrows are the last two quad fours that got Powell down on his knees. You know, begging for more central planning than you could possibly have ever imagined. Right? Since then. The dollar's been going down because we're not in quad four, okay? So the dollar has been an awesome short since June of last year. And um, it c will continue to be. That's, but my point is that if, if, if we don't have a change in the political regime, we've in fact made it worse by weaponizing the Fed with the, with the Treasury and having some outlook for MMT and you said Lyle Brainerd, to me this dollar could get complete, can completely collapse. It doesn't have to collapse from today's price. Obviously it's gone down for four of the last five weeks. But I mean like the next two years, right? The next two to three years. And I think that that's exactly what China's banking on. Right now they're using the yuan to, they're, you know, they're, they're using weakness in their own currency right now because they're dead set yeah. on regaining market share. Because the Trump trade war is finally over and because nobody here is going to stop them. So I think, but, but if you look at the longer term appreciation of Yuan and what that signifies for China eventually becoming a larger economy than the United States, which is the ultimate goal, right? Yeah. Uh, then you understand that, that they're, they're going to use the Yuan as a lever going forward with the aim of unseating the dollar. 
Well, that, I mean, you called out as you would. And again, talk about connecting the dots. This was a really good job. I mean, I didn't have the time actually this morning to, was it this morning that Druck, Druck wrote that or was it yesterday the, in the journal? This morning. Oh, this morning. So you'd already dissected it before I even knew it was there. There's a good example of why you should follow the, you know, the DDB. Um, you know, and you took this one passage that said, uh, I think this is from Druck and Miller, where you know, going back to only 400 years of history, 400 years of currency history, every time there's been a change in the reserve currency status, which tends to last about 100 years, it's another country that comes and displaces it. Uh, you can't leave China out of that discussion. Is that Druck and Miller that wrote that? Uh, no, that's my social media person. She was quoting an interview I did yesterday. I said that. You said that. Well, even better. You are the new Druck. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are Druck. Let's, that's what DDB stands for. You know, uh, Danielle Druck Booth. All right. So this is like, <laughs> this is this is a this is a big deal, right? Because who would have possibly? You and I are on a live switch here. We we anything can possibly go wrong. Like, look, we're, we could say the wrong thing. We could use Elon Musk. It's yeah, all live. Whatever, whatever happens. But when we replaced the British pound with the U.S. dollar, you're right on the right clock here, right? So you're saying. Hundred years, so years ago, British pound sterling started to lose its place yep. in the aftermath of debts that were run up in World War I. And, and so you're saying that this is just an interesting place for this to start to happen, and the Chinese would be quite happy with that. I don't think, I, I think the Chinese are the biggest cheerleaders for socialism in America. <laughs> on the oh, God. You think I'm kidding? No. <laughs> oh, my Look, God. China, China's letting companies go default at the fastest pace on record. Right? That's a pretty capitalistic thing to do if you ask me. Let let the bad players go. We're keeping them in business. We're like, no, no, we're Zombie USA. Bring it, baby. You know, they're 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 pushing robotics, they're pushing AI, they've got a third of the telecommunications equipment, they're investing. I think somebody mentioned fifty billion dollars to invest here in the, in the semiconductor industry. I mean, can you imagine? Xi Jinping's like on my pinky, fifty billion. <laughs> not working in the semiconductors so that they can, combined with Taiwan, have a third of market share globally, is enormous. And they're look. I'm not people. People think that I'm against my own country. I'm not. I just don't think that you should bring a, a, a knife to a gunfight. Yeah, you, and that we should look at the scale at which China is combating its own demographic disaster in the making. And they're like, fine, we'll make up with 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 with, te with technology. And we're like, we're like, fine, we'll pay people not to work. You're I mean, uh, let, to be clear, uh, uh, DDB, who is now known as DDB Druck or whatever, we're going to get. We're going to find something that's catchy. You know, she is one of the only American patriots that talks plainly uh, that used to work at the Federal Reserve. So let's just be clear on that. I want to clear the table on that. On that. Um, but the Chinese, like, you could go, like, you could also argue that they pushed COVID on us so that they just perpetuated all this. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways that you can get to where, what gets America to fully have all Republicans and Democrats, libertarians fully loaded, as long as they work at a place that they could get paid on it, what would get everybody to just sign off on money printing as far as the eye could see and socializing markets? Hmm. Well, you know, maybe we can go the opposite direction. Maybe Biden can appoint Trump as ambassador to China. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. You know, I, I, I wouldn't rule out anything, actually, at this point, so let's keep that in mind. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to get asked some of the questions because they're piling up and um, they get voted on and you're super popular here in our uh, audience, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start firing them off, okay? Um, uh, Luca, this one's from Italy, uh, or Luca is from Italy, from Milan, Italy. Uh, generally from mid-May, mid we witness like bullish bond seasonality. Do you, do you see the tenure heading lower uh, towards like one, two, one, three, just as treasury shorts get extreme, da, 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 da. Do you, or do you think that we're gonna go higher? Do you think we're gonna go to two and a half to 3% on the tenure? So uh, I, think, I think some of the shorts have been washed out of the system and, and freaked out. I, I think that the market has largely priced in Wednesday's CPI, tomorrow's CPI report. Yep. Uh, but two and a half percent, believe it or not, would kind of blow up the world. Oh, so, yeah. Big time. Big time. Big little yeah. pinky finger. That would be yeah. a so, big, I mean, big problem. I, I, I think that right now the Fed wants to maintain their, their, their greatest dream is a range bound right now. Range, range, range. Mm -hmm. If well, we're hitting peak growth. And if companies start to push back, 
If for any reason, this is not just a little sell in May blip and go away, the correlation between the S&P 500 and a post QE world and CEO confidence is 70%. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very mindful of the transmission mechanism between the stock market and the economy. I'm not equating the two. I'm saying that the only thing CEOs care about is their stock price. And if stocks could keep coming down for whatever the reason, it's going to bleed into the real economy. And that will eventually bring your long rates down. Yeah, I mean, the catalyst for rates to go down is obviously quad four, the economy slowing again, which, by the way, uh, is coming to a theater. theater near you. The way we look at this is that bond yields have had many head fakes sucking people into to you believing that they could actually go lower here. And they should head, uh, maybe not to two and a half, but I have it going to one nine, one nine five, one nine four. So that's that's my answer to the question. If you look at slide 61, what's interesting about this, though, is that your your comment on blow up the world is squarely in the crosshairs of what Bob Schiller taught me as classic mean reversion. Like to get to two and a half on that chart's not that hard. I mean, you're only going back three years and you go back to the prior peak of the cycle in Q4 of 18. The 10 year yield was at three and a quarter. And, and that's why that's why you can't speak flippantly and say the 10 years going to 120. Because consider the base, it's a huge delta. And that's yeah. why you can't say the 10 years going to two and a half per se, because, because consider the base, right? People, people forget people like, well, I remember when mortgages were 15% and I'm like, <laughs> consider the base from which the moves are beginning. Yes, now, now, now you've, ta you've tapped into me in ways emotionally, yeah, obviously not, you know, we're just like getting, just talking here. But I mean, it's like, you're talking calculus. That's like exponential shit there, right? People that don't know how to measure and map things and, and model things on a nonlinear basis forget exactly what you just said. It's the base. Exponents step off the base and they go up yeah. exponentially, not yeah. linearly. So when you have these econs out there that Danielle and I do not uh, espouse to be, they're like, well, I think the 10 year could go to two and then it's gonna go to two and a quarter. No, it goes up exponentially when inflation goes up. That's the number one leading indicator. That's why that's all we've been talking about. So unless you think inflation's going down from here, which is mathematically impossible, then you would be betting like I am short the long bond today and it's doing quite well for you. So that's what I think. Um, you know, we got the next question is a guy from Detroit asking the same thing. When, wh what moves you above 2%? I don't know why people use these round numbers. It's more about the, the pace to get there. Isn't that interesting, Danielle? Friday's jobs report to whoever, you know, the tourist <laughs> is going to say, oh, terrible number. You know, buy treasuries and gold, you know, and, and that from that New York minute to where it is today was a straight line up of 12 basis points on the 10 year yield. And, and the NASDAQ did not like that. No, no, because the tenure got down to 149 initially yeah. after print. Yeah. Uh, and that flight to safety was like a supersonic jet flight to safety, like, you know, <laughs> from, from Long Island to New York City. That's about how long that flight lasted. Well, so, I mean, the good thing about all that is that all, like you said, all the big swinging dicks, they all got the jets now. You know, it's like, you know, if, you, if you're really in it, of course, you're, you don't need to fly commercial. That's, that's trash, right? You got you to gotta be on that flight. You got to be making these trades. You got to trade the bonds properly. <laughs> um, Danielle, the Fed has not, this is a bill from Montana. Great questions, by the way. I love the geographic uh, span of our, of, of our audience. Uh, Danielle, the Fed has not tightened yet, but what are you watching to measure how the market might tighten monetary conditions? Well, the market's constantly pushing that envelope, right? That's the exact tension that, that, that you and yep. I are speaking about, Keith. I mean, it, it, the market has been, if you're talking about stock market declines, um, again, I think that, that there were so many coordinated Fed speakers last week who were talking about frothiness in markets, Powell was the first one to say it, that he, you know, he saw some frothiness in stock prices. I think, again, right now the Fed is trying to soft, to engineer a soft correction in the stock market. They don't want to be, they don't want for people who don't know what a triple C bond is to say, but triple C's are trading at the lowest on record. They don't want to hear that because they know the last time triple C's were trading as low as they are today, that it did not end well at all. I mean, triple C is right above D for default, period end. <laughs> so the signposts that the Fed is getting right now are irrefutable, but they also have to watch out for this thing called the credit market. And you cannot have a, you know, a transmission mechanism that gets started between credit and the stock market, not after all of the work that the Fed did to bail out the credit market in the first place in March 2020. Right. That was a lot of heavy lifting. That was hard work. 
that was almost like real manual labor. That was hard. Yeah, they did all that. Uh, here's, a, here's another. If you're apoplectic about this conversation that Daniela and I are having, it's okay. Okay. So Buck in, Buck in Aspen, Colorado uh, is asking this question too. And again, um, it's a really interesting question. Is there anything, is there anyone in the Fed who could take Powell's place and quote unquote, turn over the stones by raising rates significantly and reintroduce price discovery? Similar to Japan in the early 2000s. I love your book, Fed Up. Thank you. Well, thank you. And no. <laughs> no, like, Look, they took, they took Judy Shelton out to the slaughter because she believed in sound money principles. She made some political gaffes. I will, I will give you that. But they took Judy Shelton, the establishment took Judy Shelton to the woodshed. Hundreds upon hundreds of signatures saying we cannot have, we only have yes men, we only have yes women. No, need not, need not even get anywhere near the Eccles building. For God, they put, they, they, they put in the director of research for Bullard, for God's sake. I mean, you're talking about, he wakes up every morning and says, where's my dovish inspiration? Oh, that's right. He went off to the Federal Reserve Board. Damn. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, no, I don't think that there's anybody with the stones and they'd never get nominated. What what president, Republican or Democrat, would ever nominate somebody like Volcker today? No. So ask yourself, what president has the stones to put somebody like Volcker in a leadership position at the Fed today? Maybe they don't. Need, maybe they don't. Battle that he's. By the way, Powell's fighting the opposite battle of a Volcker. He's 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 fighting with a debt laden system that is constantly being subjected to disinflationary pressures because that's what debt is. Couldn't normalized. He did not have to bail out the junk bond market. He did not have to do what he did. He could have let a few chips fall where they may. He could have still done whatever Drucken Miller was saying, 30%, um, uh, you know, 100, $100 billion a day for a few weeks. Yeah, people, it's interesting on that point. You know how everybody that's in officialdom and establishment econs, the transitory crowd, oh, it's transitory. Um, yeah, uh, they don't quite say it's transitory when high yield went up. You know, high yield. You know, when when that when high yield spreads started to collapse and they all made their money back that they shouldn't have made back in high yield because the Fed bailed their ass out. They didn't call those returns transitory. I couldn't find that in anybody's um, year end <laughs> statement. Did you? No. 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 Nope. No. No. It's uh, transitory is only on the sides of the things that you may be concerned about. Uh, <laughs> and again, this could prove to be. This could actually prove to be transitory. We, we may get there in Q1. We, we might. Well, the transitory that the, you mean the high yield market being safe? No, 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 hell no. No, I mean, we, we, inflation could prove to, to not be so sticky that it, that we're still having the same conversation a year from now. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, tra transitory is a stupid word. I mean, it's, 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 it's it, inflation will always be cyclical. And once you lap next year, these base effects, it's going to slow. And it's, that's well, not that I complicated. What, I can tell you what inflation's gonna do based on what Joe Manchin does next. Well, there's, and then there's that. There's the escape, you know, there's the linear function that is Joe Manchin, Joe Manchin going the one way and that dollar collapsing from here, you're not gonna get my base effect argument. You're gonna be having the oh, holy shit argument. And that's, by the way, anything that you own that's a hard asset's already making the argument for you in your account. So transitory is not your returns if you're long inflation. If you've been long inflation since June, well done. Okay, um, uh, last question, just uh, th maybe not the last one, but at least this is an easy one. Um, Dave in California, not an e easy answer, but a simple one to ask because it's short. Uh, Dave in California, Danielle, what, if anything, would trigger the Fed to capitulate on these inflation uh, numbers that we're talking about and actually raise rates? Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I think that they're going to let, you know, inflation end it. 2000, I want to say 2013 at 3%. And then it was down at like 0.5 in two years. I, I, I think, I'm sorry, yeah, no, 2011, right. 2011, yeah. and then it, then it came down. Sorry. Um, I, I've got my years off, but the feds, um, I mean, that's really, really hard to say if, if it's because th that's why they keep using the word average, average inflation, because they're trying to average out the last sub 2% years, plural, right? They've only hit their two, the two percent bogey twelve times since Bernanke introduced the two percent target for inflation. 
Um, but I mean, if you were to start to see four or 5% prints, I can only imagine the pressure that would be building. If you were to see wage inflation take off, that changes the discussion. Yeah, and it's going, it's, it always takes off at the end of the movie. It's not like it's not going to take off. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so if you get, you, this whole thing, you know, um, and, and, and maybe that's the problem, is it's like we have a failure to communicate, like in real world words. Like, it's never the average of things. Like, has anybody at the Federal Reserve ever mentioned the words fractal math? Have they ever talked in terms of the particular things that happen in the natural world? It's a particular thing that happens to you at a particular time that changes things. It's not the average of things that's happened to you while you're driving down the road and, and then you get in a car accident because that's just your average is up. It's just, it's, it's so stupid. The way that we have reduced ourselves as a profession relative to any other profession that we put big multiples on. Like, it's not like the other professions don't understand the words. They don't, it's not like they don't understand fractal geometry. It's not like you don't have people actually evolving. But these people, these linear econs, I mean, is, who is? Tell me, other than you, uh, <laughs> and some of our very close friends on Twitter, who is the most likely answer, like our answer on that front? Somebody who's nonlinear. Somebody who believes in exponential math. Somebody who believes in the secret to the universe, calculus. Who in, your, in policy world... You know, Fed policy, so think, economic policy. Who is the up and comer? No, I, I, um, I think that Schiller speaks the most rationally right now. Bob Schiller? Mm -hmm. He's old school though, man. He's like my old teacher. I mean, I'm like, I'm getting old. It's not like, I don't mean an old guy. I mean like, a, I'm old. A, young, a okay. young economist, a young thinker. A strapping, uh, well, I, I, I think the answer is actually you. But if you, I'm trying to find somebody out there that's dynamic as the world is that's willing to speak the truth, that's out there. Is there anybody that you see that's out there that's, that's um, younger than, you're, you're a lot younger than me, so younger than you? Um, they've yet to show up on my Twitter feed, which is fairly unusual. I mean, there aren't that many people who are like psychotic on Twitter talking about the Fed. <laughs> There's nobody. Do you think we're psychos? Like, I, I obviously just- No, I just think that I get psychotic that I when I think about, you know, what, you know, let, let's get rid of Powell. Let's put in Brainerd. Let's bring Ken Rogoff into the party. Let's go cash. Let's let, let's go negative interest rates and let's implement MMT. And then we can all learn Mandarin and it'll all end well. It, no, there's good reason to be psychotic. Given some of the dreams that these people have, given some of the visions that their models have told them will work, not in the real world, but you know, wherever their brains live. I, uh, there is one person who's a, a little younger than I am. Uh, he went to the same school as me, so don't, don't rap his knuckles too hard from Texas on this, okay? He's a Yale guy. His name's DeSantis. He had a, I think he batted like 330, captain of the BL baseball team. He speaks English, like economic English. Uh, I think that you and I could convince him of some of this stuff. Okay. What Not all academics are, I mean, Gar Gary Schilling is as old as the hills. <laughs> he, he's, he's awesome. Still he still speaks in a fairly rational way, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't, I don't think it's a matter of age. I think it's a matter of, of humility and perspective. Both. Well, uh, I think age, just because you know, as the I'm thinking fourth turning, like a generational turn, because you know, the fact of the matter is that you know, I might stay on the right side of the grass for a reasonable amount of years if I'm lucky enough. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that boomers are moving out politically, and Gen Xers, <laughs> our generation, is is moving in. Uh, Kamala's kind of like the leader on one side of that, but I'm, and I'm DeSantis probably one of the leaders on the other political side of the aisle. That's why I mentioned him. Um, but I'm, I'm just I'm just curious because I, I, I don't uh, I, I don't obviously notice everything or everyone. And I was wondering if there's anybody out there that um, you know piqued your attention. I'll get back to you, Keith. Let's keep but looking. We need somebody who understands not cryptocurrency per se, but understands central bank digital digital currencies and we need somebody like that in a hurry yeah i think that'd be cool like so maybe a good way to end this what's been as always a real conversation thank you for having it with me and for letting me sound like i'm psychotic uh it's 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 you don't sound psychotic you look great you know it's good to see you're traveling again and everybody's uh got ddb in in the office and doing some meetings but um, maybe that's a, a good thing for us to, to, to try to pull out. You know, like let's, after this, let's try to ask our audiences on Twitter, it, who, who let's, let's create a community of people. Let's try to get some people on a list. Let's try to find some people that are actually thinking on a nonlinear basis that might be willing to rattle the cage. This is still America after all. 
I like that part. I do love my country. I'm wearing red. I'm red blooded. So I, yes. I love that. I got a little red here too. The Dubuque Fighting Saints. You know, for those of you that are in the Midwest, a little hockey team we own part of. So thank you, thank you so much. Awesome conversation, and, and you kept it real. Doesn't she just keep it real? Like, why why can't people do this? Just have real conversations. Thanks for joining us.